I see some very familiar faces, and I see some very uh, important faces, and I, and I know why you're here. It's because Dr. Bug is, is really one of the leading mycologists in the country, that, and especially when it comes to the psychedelic world, has got quite the history. And we were really honored and pleased that he's been willing to come and, and share some of his uh, thoughts with us. Uh, this talk, uh, uh, he left. He gave us a really funny name, and I, everybody said, what is that about? Who's my daddy? What are we talking about? <laughs> You guys all know, but we should probably maybe next year make things a little clearer for newbies who don't understand taxonomy is probably one of the craziest parts of all of Mushroom World. So please give a big welcome to Michael Bug and thank him so much for being here. Well, I'm going to start with just a little bit of advertising for the North American Mycological Association. I'm on the education committee of that organization, and I also chair of the toxicology committee, so I collect poisoning reports from all of North America. So if anyone ever gets poisoned, you just go to namico.org, and then you fill in a form, hit the send button, and it comes to me, and then once a year I summarize what happened to people over the year. But also as part of my education role with that group, um, I've written about 25 of these PowerPoint programs, and this is one of them, and it's narrated, automatic, advanced, and if you're a NAMA member, which isn't that expensive, you can get these programs absolutely free. If you belong to a mushroom club or a, or a, a garden club and you want to show them something about mushrooms, then, then you have this resource at your hands. And so what got me started here was looking through my slide collection, which dates back to when I started hunting mushrooms in 1968, and looking at the names that I had written on the slide, and then crossed out, and the name I had written in over it, and then crossed out in the name I had added on top of it. So I put together this little, it's a fairly short program for NAMA, so we should finish, uh, finish early. Okay, now let's see. Okay, so first of all, here's this, this, uh, the upper left in my slide collection originally said Cantharellus sibarius, and then there was Cantharellus subalbidus, the white chanterelle, sibarius, the yellow chanterelle, and then Cantharellus clavatus, um, which we called the, you know, the violet chanterelle, or, or it's sort of a lilac chanterelle. There is one that's even more violet. And then Cantharellus flocosus. Now, you will notice that some parts of some of these names are in parentheses. And that's, that's a hint of what's to come. But this is, this is how these things were named when I first started um, hunting them. And Cantharellus sibarius, you know, edible and choice. Uh, Sobalbidus, another edible and choice mushroom, but one I don't like to eat too much because when it comes up through the ground, it gets embedded with little bits of dirt and pine needles, and it's just a pain in their rear to clean. And then uh, Cantharellus clavatus, getting ahead of myself here, Cantharellus clavatus uh, is considered edible and choice, and in my 40 years now of hunting mushrooms, I have never found it when it wasn't riddled with maggots. So I haven't got a clue what it actually tastes like. But I've always talked about, okay, here's this choice edible, go out and find it and eat it. And then Cantharellus flocosus, uh, which is, was called the woolly chanterelle, is its common name. And I told everyone, okay, now this one is poisonous. You don't, you don't want to eat this one. And I'm not so sure it's seriously poisonous, but it is, it is somewhat poisonous in, in, in retrospect now. Now, did I go? Something seems. Okay. Cantharellus subalbidus. <coughs> of the four chanterelles, that this is the only one that still retains the name that, that it had when I began mushrooming. And. Um, so this is still subalbidus. I haven't had to cross anything out. And then there was the yellow chanterelle, Cantharellus sibarius. But it turns out that in the Pacific Northwest where I live, at the time, we said, well, we don't have sibarius. We have 
Cantharellus formosus. So all of my slides saying Siparius, I crossed out the Siparius and wrote in formosus. Now that I look at this slide, which was taken by one of my mentors, Kit Skates Barnhart, um, I'm not even sure that's Cantharellus formosus unless she colored up that slide. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> but, uh, and so then, looking through my slide box, I had all these slides. Now everything nicely labeled Cantharellus formosus, because that's what we had in the Northwest, not Cantharellus siberius. Notice these mushrooms down in the bottom look a little different. They look kind of like the white chantro, but a much brighter yellow on the edge. And I got to wondering, now this one over here, this one grows up my vineyard, and that's where I took that photograph. It took my wife and I two and a half meals to eat that one. Whoa. That'll give you an idea of the size of this particular chantro. And so, We'd been eating on these for a couple of three years, and I got to wondering, this. golly, you know, that doesn't look a lot like the other Cantharellus formosus we've been eating. I wonder what we're eating. And, and then, of course, for three years, couldn't find it. None at all. <clears throat> and so we hunted and hunted and hunted. And then, the, and the upper one, too, will have its own story. Because, but notice it's got, doesn't show really well, it's kind of a rosy bloom along the edge of the outer part of the cap. And so I began to wonder about that Cantharellus formosus as well as this Cantharellus formosus. And so the top one, it turns out, is actually Cantharellus siberius. So we did have it in the northwest. It grows right on the coast under spruce, and it grows, at for us, high altitude. 5,000 feet under spruce. <laughs> now at home, high at 5,000 feet, I'm still hitting snow fields right now, just to give you a comparison to here. But so under the spruce, we find this beautiful Cantharellus severus variety roseocanus, because when you do the DNA work, this matches the Cantharellus severus of Europe pretty well, but is very different from the Cantharellus formosus that I had at labeled as. So, and eventually this one is going to become probably Cantharellus roseocanus. They'll drop the Severius part and just call it Cantharellus roseocanus. Now, how many of you have picked chanterelles here at this foray? Okay. Or looked at them at the ID tables? How much does the Cantharellus Severius look like this thing that you're finding? And it certainly doesn't look like that. I finally did find it, and just in time, one of my former students, Tom O'Dell, was doing the DNA work for the Forest Service down in Corvallis on a mushroom they were finding in the Central Oregon Cascades. And so this becomes Cantharellus cascadensis, and, and my collection became part of the collection they used to name this thing, and I found it just in time and, and, and sent it down there and got it named. And then, but there was also another chanterelle. I said, oh, I've got another new species. There was what I called the white-footed chanterelle because from the top, it looked an awful lot like a yellow chanterelle usually, although not so much in this picture. But from the bottom, it was almost always white. And I says, oh, I got another new one. But the DNA said, nope, just sell the albatus, nothing special. And Catharellus uh, cascadensis turns out to be very closely related to Subalbidus. Cantharellus formosus turns out to be very closely related to Subalbidus, but the Severius variety roseocanus is a very different, very different thing. So, this photograph was taken of Cantharellus Severius in Finland very close to where the original Cantharellus severius was collected and photographed. And that's why I'm thinking that around here, somebody needs to take the Cantharellus severius, send it in for DNA, 
and we'll try and get a name on whatever it is. Now, all of these things, fortunately, are edible in choice, so it's no problem and we don't know what the heck we're eating. You know, and because always I tell people, make sure you know the species before you eat something so you don't get poisoned. Uh, with chanterelles, we seem to be able to get away uh, without worrying about that. So, Cantharella sebarius in California, Cantharella sebarius in Texas, mm -hmm. and the New Mexico stuff is the same as what we have here, because uh, this was photographed you know, really pretty close to the Colorado border, not that far away. Cantharella sebarius in England, I mean in New England. So, quite a bunch of different animals out there that we're all calling sebarius. But as we do DNA, and now it's gotten down, it costs about six bucks. Really? Yeah, wow. per shot. And we're starting, it, I'm in the Pacific Northwest Key Counts, and it's a group of basically all the professional mycologists and all the serious amateurs in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, British Columbia, Alberta, and Western Montana. And we meet twice a year to write keys, and we have a foray. But now everything we collect, we're drawing, and we're going to start not only saving it, but doing the DNA on it. And I'll bet we're going to start finding a whole bunch of interesting new things when, when we start doing that. So are you saying that in, in theory those will all be four different names in the future? Well, will the real Cantharellus sebarius please stand up? Uh, <laughs> that one in Finland, that's the real Cantharellus sebarius because that's where it was first described. I'm betting that those other four that I just showed, the Texas one, the New Mexico one, the California one is now named as, 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 as at least one person in this, it's the mud puppy, uh, you know, the big, uh, it's an oak chanterelle. Cal Cantharellus uh, californicus, is that, I think what, yeah, okay. What about uh, Cantharellus lateritius? That's a big edible we have in Texas. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's a smooth thing underneath. Yeah. It doesn't have, so if we back up here, he's referring, if you see all of these have these blunt forking ridges underneath. And there's a really good edible that, uh, that, that Heinz just mentioned, Cantharellus lateritius. It's smooth under here. And, and, so, and that's already got its own name. We don't think it's Sibarius. But I'll bet we, and we already know, oh, I actually, I put the name on it. I think that was what we're calling Cantharellus californicus, but I've never personally seen californicus. I was just looking at Kit's slide collection, and she'd label it Sibarius, and I inherited her slide collection when she passed on, so I have all of these things to draw on, and, um, <clears throat> and Peter Katsaros, who's another great photographer and a great uh, mycologist from New England, his stuff has all gone to NAMA, and I've got a CD with all of his images so I can compare these things around the country. So, Cantharellus kaufmannii, now Gomphus kaufmannii, and uh, it rarely is as big as, as this one that, that Judy Roger uh, is holding. But I was really, really upset when they moved this thing to Gomphus. I says, I've learned it as Cantharellus. It's a perfectly good looking Cantharellus. It's got the nice blunt forking ridges underneath. It isn't gilled. It's got, and if you tear it apart, texturally it feels like a chanterelle. When I identify mushrooms, I rip them apart, I bite on them, you know, I taste them, I get the feel, get all those senses as part of the identification. Perfectly good chanterelle. Why do they have to go around and move this thing. And so within mycology, we have what's called lumpers and splitters. The lumpers would put all of these things in chanterelles, and then the splitters, and this was split out in Gomphus due to some rather different microscopic features. Microscopically, it didn't seem to fit chanterelles, so we moved it. But then when we got DNA and we did the DNA typing, we find Gomphus is not related to chanterelles even remotely. 
It's a totally different animal. So those things that the early mycologists had looked at and said, hey, this doesn't quite fit Cantharellus, we better make it gomphus, actually turned out to be really good features. And so we've moved it. And um, what is gomphus related to? If it's not related to the chanterelles that it looks just like, this is what gomphus is related to. <laughs> it falls out right in the middle of the ramarias. So here we have these gorgeous coral mushrooms, and I've seen some beautiful ramarias on this trip. And if I had my microscope and my chemicals, I would have named a few of them for you because ramarias are one of my special loves. And I'm one of the few people idiotic enough to try and put names on Romarias. <laughs> and what isn't in this program, we now know that not all Romarias are Romaria. <laughs> it's just been split up <laughs> since I wrote the program. <laughs> because they don't all come from the same lineage. So evolutionarily, we have, we have what we called convergent evolution and then di versus divergent evolution. The gomphus, which came from a common ancestor of the Ramaria, has experienced convergent evolution with the line of chanterelle. So it evolved to look like a chanterelle even though it came from very different parents. It's had a different daddy and mommy. And so, so Ramaria and boy, it was, it was really hard to think of this beautiful Romaria as being very much more like Gomphus. And, and here's another one, uh, another beautiful Romaria. This is probably Romaria sandrosina. Uh, when I took the picture, I was not yet doing the kind of chemistry and, and microscopy that I needed to do to know for sure, because there's a lot of beautiful yellow Romarias. And we're mostly finding beautiful yellow Romarias at this foray, probably Largentii is what we're finding, but without looking. And Romaria was lumped in with what we call the clubs and corals. So Romaria was considered very closely related to Claveria delphus truncatus. And I've seen some truncatus on the table. And by the way, when truncatus is young, it's a delicious edible. It gets a little, it's kind of sweet, very tasty, and sometimes those ones on the left were 10 inches tall. You know, the ones I've seen here were just little ones. But it can be a nice, good-sized mushroom. And Claveria delphus, indeed, when you do the DNA, turns out to be closely related to Gomphus and Romaria. So our idea that Romaria belongs in with the clubs and corals, at least so far, is making a lot of sense. Claveria delphus, closely related to Romaria. And so here's another Claveria delphus, a little tiny one, a little cute one, too small to eat. But sometimes I just see troops of these going up through the woods, and they're just so beautiful. I love to look at these things. What's this puffball doing in here? Geastrum. Um, Claveria delphus, Romaria, and Gomphus are all related to some of the gastromycetes. And in particular, they're closely related to the genus Geastrum. So these all have, these are all cousins. They're all coming out very, very close together. Now this thing's a very interesting mushroom because it forms underground. And then when the spores are developed, it has an outer thick peridium, an outer casing, that cracks, splits, rotates down, pushes the mushroom up out of the ground onto the surface, and then raindrops or somebody walking by will hit that and disperse the puffball-like spores. Really neat ecologically. And then we have Spherobolus stellatus. These things are about yay tall, an eighth of an inch tall. They really like to grow in bark mulch and wood mulch and compost. And if you've parked your car alongside bark mulch and you come outside and it's full of little 
black dots glued to the side and you can't wash them off, you park by a bed of Spherobola stellatus. Because this thing has its spores in a little black ball and there's about 100 or 200 spores in the ball. And underneath the ball is a sac. Here's one that's blown up. At first it's closed like this and then it starts to open and suddenly the sac just inflates whoo, and throws the ball about 15, 20 feet away. And if your car happens to be sitting within range, you've got a real clean job to do. And, and that's how it spreads. And so this very unique, very interesting thing, and it's always fascinating me because of that way, the way it spreads, is related to Romeria and to that geastrum, which is quite a different thing. But they're all very, very tightly, closely together. Now we have Claveria purpurea. And I'm sorry, but it's not Claveria purpurea anymore. <laughs> and I don't remember what they had just renamed it in, in my old brain. It didn't retain the brand new name. But Romeria was originally called Claveria. All the Romerias were part of the genus Claveria. <clears throat> well, Romerias aren't even at all related to Claverias. Totally different animals. Now it turns out that this thing is not related to Claveria either. So it's gotten a name change since I wrote this program. And, but I've seen some nice collections of Claveria purpurea here. And so there's some good hillsides of this thing around. And we can call it Claveria purpurea, even though that's not its name anymore, because if you pick up Gary Linkoff's book, you know, on the Ottoman Guide or any of the other books, it'll say Claveria purpurea, and you'll feel good. And as long as you can figure out what the mushroom is and relate it, then you can look up on Index Fungorum and see what the latest official name is. I have that just as a separate little thing on the top of my computer, so I just have to push a button I click on index for Ngorum and it loads and then I can type in the name and see what somebody has done to it lately. And so I track, I track things now that way. Um, and then Claveria vermicularis, now it did turn out to be Claveria, so it stayed there, but it's not at all related to Romeria, and, um, nor but this looks a little like Claveria delphus ligula, but it's not related to Claveria delphus ligula either. And I have, to, I have to follow notes. I usually don't like to use notes, but this gets so dang messy. Um, Claveria species arose from a line containing most of the gilled mushrooms. So the majority of the gilled mushrooms are closely related to these Claverias. But not all the gilled mushrooms, as we'll see, are related to each other. But the bulk of the gilled mushrooms, that, so this thing evolved from a common parent of the majority of the gilled mushrooms, not at all from the parent that gave rise to the geastrums and the gomphus and the cantharellus. Those all very, very different animals. And then Clavulinopsis laticolor, basically a beautiful orange version of um, Claveria delphus ligula, but Clavulinopsis turns out to be closely related to Claveria. So again, it's a descendant of a gilled mushroom. Beautiful little thing, but way too small to think about eating. Um, now we've suddenly got a polypore, Fistulina hepatica. Only this is a soft, fleshy polypore, grows on hardwoods. And people call it the beefsteak polypore because you can slice it up. It's got kind of an acidic flavor. I've never eaten it. I imagine there's a few people here who have. But there are people who like to eat Fistulina hepatica. And um, it's closely related to Claveria, <coughs> to Clavionopsis, and to most of the gilled mushrooms, but not at all related to most of the polypores. And yet, we treat this as a polypore, analyze it, and work with it as if it's a polypore. But it's a soft, fleshy polypore, but it's really a descendant of a gilled mushroom, Fistulina hepatica. And then we have Clavi corona pixidata. Looks kind of like a Romeria, a coral. This is a really close up view. This thing is a little bunch of things about the size of my hand sitting up like that. And the tips, 
are these little crowns. And that's where you get the clavi corona, the crown. Uh, and, and so there's the little one and then the close-up of the ends in the one image. Looks like a perfectly respectable coral mushroom, but its closest rib relatives do not look at all like the other clubs and corals. The closest relative to this are the tooth fungus, our Scalpium vulgaris, and then these sawtoothed edged guild mushrooms, which aren't related to any of the other guild mushrooms. These, this group form a tight group from a common ancestor. So we have Lentinellus montanus, very uh, <coughs> bitter, awful tasting thing and kind of tough and woody to start with. Um, and then Omphalotus michnerii, which used to be Lentinellus um, omphaloides, but we won't get into that little mess up. And then this gorgeous little Arscalpium vulgara. This is a Douglas fir cone. So you can sort of get the size of this little tooth mushroom. Um, so clavi corona, the thing that looks when you see it from a distance, oh, there's a white ramaria, has its closest relatives with this bunch here. Now, so how do we tell what mushrooms are going to be related to others? In almost all of these cases, once we know the DNA, there are certain features we can look at in the mushroom and say, oh yeah, that's, that makes sense, because they have these macroscopic features in common. But we have to compare the right things. For example, we could look at for, for carotenoid pigments, you know, the pig, kind of pigments you find in carrots, and you find the carotenoid pigments in chanterelles, and you also find them in hygrosophies. So are these two related because they have the same pigment? So they've got some of the same biochemical machinery. Does that mean they, they're related and it turns out when you do the DNA? Uh-uh. So that's not a unifying feature that we can use, but quite often there are some unifying features. Now, hygrosophies, by the way, are some of, I think, some of the most, and hygrophora species. Really, really gorgeous. And We've, I've seen a lot of Hygrosabi uh, conica uh, showing up. And bruise is black, but it's a beautiful, beautiful red. They're very clean looking, spectacular mushrooms. So we've got to figure out what you can trust in telling things together. For example, this thing. Denti I learned it as Dentinum rapandum. It's now Hiddenum rapandum. And um, if you eat it, First of all, when you cut it up to prepare it, it bruises sort of a yellowish orange, just like a chanterelle bruises when you cut it up to eat it. And if you fondle it, tear it apart, get mean with it, it feels like a chanterelle. And darned if it doesn't taste like a chanterelle. A little sweeter, much better eating, unless they're really big, you know, and they, they can sometimes get bitter, but these are chanterelles in reality. So now, and once I heard that oh, it's a chanterelle, it made sense because it tastes like a chanterelle, it behaves like a chanterelle when I cook it, it's just a little bit better. Some people call this the sweet tooth and then it's got a smaller relative that's the true sweet tooth, but it's a tooth thing like this. and. Um, it's now hidden in Merpandum. So, there also was a white one out there. And that was the other thing that helped secure it. So in, so in the Northwest, we have a white hidden in Merpandum, or hidden in Albidum, and a yellow one. So we have a white and a yellow chanterelle, we have a white and a yellow hidden. Them. Fits beautifully and DNA-wise, beautifully. <coughs> I've only found this mushroom once. This photograph's at Mount Rainier, but tasted great. Didn't wind up in my herbarium, unfortunately, but wound up in the, in the cook pot. 
So, maybe we should use common names. Now, I won't name the individual who chairs the NAMA committee uh, to create this list of common names for all of our mushrooms in North America, since he's sitting in the audience and might be embarrassed if I, if I said anything more than that. But uh, what happens? Can we go to common names to solve this problem of all these name changes? Well, is this the spreading hedgehog? The common hedgehog tooth? Is it the sweet tooth? Is it the yellow tooth fungus? Is it the pig trotter? These are all names for this mushroom. So, you can't escape. Why do I like scientific names? Why am I always throwing those out? I, I, I don't know if you noticed in the parade yesterday, there was this one really neat costume um, it was Phallus uh, Induziatus was the costume. The woman was all in white and had this white frilly thing and then this little uh, <clears throat> head on it. It really does look like Phallus. <laughs> and then she had her little dog made up as Phallus. And, and I tried to speak to her, but she's Japanese, you know, and she barely speaks English. So we were able to communicate very well. And I have some beautiful Japanese mushroom books. And I can't read a word of kanji, but they have the Latin. They have the scientific name. Because the other problem, if we go to common names to solve this problem of all these changes, every country has got a different common name. And so the way around it, unfortunately, is the scientific names. And this is the one that I call the real sweet tooth, uh, Hydnum umbilicatum. Just a little thing, about yay big around, about the size of a quarter to a half a dollar. Not very big, kind of inconsequential. I've only eaten it once. It was two days after Christmas. It hadn't snowed yet at our house. We often get snow like by Thanksgiving. And I went out, and there was a couple, and I picked a couple in a bag and picked a couple more. And Pretty soon I had a lunch bag full, and I've always figured this is too small to pick, and took them home and cooked them up, and man, is this a good mushroom. It really, really is the sweet tooth. This might be my number one favorite mushroom of all the mushrooms I've eaten. And I've looked for it again and again and again. So, I'm every November, I, and this is when this starts to fruit, Three years ago in November, a, a mycologist from the University of Washington, Joe Imerati, called me up and said, what cortinarius grow under the oaks? And I said, there aren't any cortinarius under oaks. None. They're never there. And I live right in the middle of an oak grove. And, um, and this is the Oregon white oak he was specifically asking about. So I said, well, I'll go out and take a look. And it was November 15th. I went out and I found five cortinarius. <laughs> And I'm not talking about the little brown telemonias. These were what we call phlegmasiums, big, beautiful corals, I mean, uh, cortinarius things. Orange cap, chestnut capped, you know, all kinds of beautiful colors. So I did a little bit of chemistry on them, did some microscopy on them, sent Joe the photographs, and he says, those are five new species. <laughs> so I went out a couple days later, different part of the oak woods, found six more, did the work up, sent them off to Joe. Six more new species. At this point, after three years, I'm up to 40, of which one has a name. 39 new species. They only fruit from November 15th until the snow falls. Now last year, that was just before Thanksgiving. So why this story? Where, why did I diverge here? So I'm walking through the woods to take Joe over to one of my Cortinarius patches because the, Cortinar the oaks, my house is li literally on the south of it of a beautiful oak, white oak grove. Never a Cortinarius in there in the fall. It, it does have a few little brown, ugly things in the spring that are Cortinarius. And I kind of was aware of that, but nothing in the fall. But, but a 15 minute walk away, here's 
20 of these new species of Cortinarius, all growing mixed in together. And each week, there's a different bunch of species. But as we're walking through the woods, I said, oh, there was a couple of hidden repandums. So, uh, and Joe says, well, you know, that's a species complex. There's a whole bunch of those out there. There's not just one. And so we've tr I, now I'm trying to collect a bunch of these to get the DNA done so we can start to split up these nice um, sweet tooths. They all taste the same, though. You don't have to worry about that. But soon there's going to be a whole bunch of new names here. And it comes because I'm working on a whole bunch of, not new names for Cortinarius, but Cortinarius names for the first time. And, and, and I can't believe, you know, we're talking about Cortinarius this big around and gorgeous. There's some are lilacs, some smell like anise. Some, would, some if you put a drop of potassium hydroxide on the stem, it just turns carmine red. It's so beautiful. And, and, and lots of features, and yet, Unnamed. So that's the other interesting. So Gomphus clavatus, one of the le least three species called pig's ears. So this is the other problem with common name. What if we pick pig's ears for this one? Well, then what do we do about this sign of perlata, which is pig's ears? What do we do about the other things that are called pig's ears? So again, we get stuck back how many, on the common names. And then Cantharellus infundibuliformis, Cantharellus tubeformis. Two rather beautiful chanterelles. Well, didn't work. They're not chanterelles. And so. <clears throat> If we're still okay. <coughs> what I now know is that tubiformis has no standing. All of these things are in fundibuliformis, but it should be in craterellus. That's what they genetically turn out to be. But Heinz had asked about craterellus already. Craterellus is these things that don't have the veins, the blunt ridges underneath. They're smooth underneath. And yet, this is a craterellus, and craterellus cornucopoides uh, is, is, a, is a choice edible. Bloody hard to see. It's another one of those mushrooms that come up really late in the season. But in big clusters, there's a commercial mushroom picker just down a mile down the road from me that I'm good friends with, and I'll go over, and in November, he'll have flats, yay by yay by yay deep, three or four stacked high with Craterellus cornucopoides. Of course, it doesn't grow where I live. It's not there. It's officially not there. It's not in any of the books. I can't find it. I'm picking in his backyard. He's picking in my backyard. And he comes up with boxes of this thing. I come up empty-handed. But smooth and yet Cantharellus tubiformis turns out to be a craterellus. Is genetically, even though it's got those nice anastomizing ridges underneath, those forks and branches, it's not a chanterelle, it's a craterellus. Clavulina cristata. So, as I mentioned, Romeria was once in Clavulina. But it turns out it's not related to clavulina. It's related to gompus. So what is clavulina related to? It's closely related to the chanterelles. <laughs> and it's also closely related to craterellus. So chanterelles and craterellus and clavulina all form what we call a clade. They're all clustered together. They all came from a common ancestor, even though they all look dramatically different. So, by now it should be clear the assemblage of what we call clubs and corals is comprised of an assortment of vastly different lineages, all having arrived at a similar appearance through divergent means. Now, my favorite mushroom. Maybe, maybe even better than the sweet tooth, but this is one I have to cultivate or buy. And now that I no longer 
live right by Paul Stamets. He used to give me a 20 pound box of these things every other month. Uh, you got to go spend the money on shiitake. Well, this was Lentinus edotis, and it grows the best flavored shiitake are grown on oak logs. And, um, and this was when the Ostrom's Mushroom Company was, was doing their failed experiment on, on Lentinus edotis. Well, this is Lentinus tigrinus, and this was the mushroom that was the first thing ever named a Lentinus. So it's called the type for the genus. There's also a type for a species. So anything that's actually related to this when you do the DNA is going to be a Lentinus. But if the DNA is vastly different, it can't be a Lentinus anymore. So my beautiful Lentinus edotes that I'd known as Lentinus edotes ain't related to this. So Long, many years ago, somebody said, it shouldn't be Lentinus edotes, it should be Lentinula edotes. But look at all the different names this thing's had. Calibia, Armillaria, Agaricus, Lepiota, Parotus, on and on and on and on. All these different names. So people have struggled placing this thing. And Shiitake is very closely related to this thing here, which was, in my original slides, called Calibia dryophila. And I found a number of quote-unquote Calibias on this 4A2. There's plenty of them up in the woods. But the very first named Calibia were these little tiny parasitic things that grow from a sclerotium. See, this is growing up here. This is tuberosa. And so this is the sclerotium, and it forms in a rotten old mushroom. And so this is, all, and Clibia cookii and serrata doesn't have a sclerotium. Cookii, that's the sclerotium, that kind of round thing that it's growing from. So these are Calibias. And anything that's not genetically related to this can't be a Calibia. So my Lent Lentinus edotes that became Lentinula edotes, which is close to Calibia dryophila, but Calibia dryophila isn't cl close to these, and these are the original Calibias. And, and I don't remember which one of these is the type for the genus, but um, so the rules of priority then say that the first thing that gets named gets to keep it. And that, the interesting thing is when it came to psilocybe, we found a way to break that rule to keep the blueing psilocybes in the genus psilocybe by changing the type for the genus. They changed the type for the genus from psilocybe montana to psilocybe semilanciata. And Scott Redhead and Lorelei Norvell, and they got together and got the international committee to agree to do this so that all of us people who talk about psilocybes can still talk about psilocybes, but we had, they had to change the type. So occasionally you can fudge the rule <laughs> if, if something is so well known and so popular and people say, we can't give up psilocybe and start you know, giving all our bluing hallucinogenic things some new name. So they changed the type. That was the trick they did. Now, so Calibia dryophila becomes Gymnopolis. Now, because this, in Latin, the sex of Calibia is different than the sex of Gymnopus, and I don't know Latin for squat, we had to change the ending slightly. Now, what the heck is this CF? CF means conforms to, in, or it, it looks like. What it means is when I took the picture, I didn't do the microscopy. So I think this is Dryophila, but I can't prove it. Um, Now, I have a slide in my box that was first labeled Armillaria malia, then Armillariella malia, then back to Armillaria malia, then Armillaria ostiae, and now Armillaria solidipes for this thing, the honey mushroom. 
But it turns out, at the beginning, we thought in the United in North America we had one honey mushroom. Now we know we have nine or so. And so when we found out we had nine, people said, "Oh, this is going to be Ostea." And Ostea is particularly interesting to me for two reasons. One, it's the most pathogenic of all the armillarias. It, it can actually kill trees. But the other thing is, a given armillaria ostea plant will be the same age as the forest in which it is growing, and the plant, the one tree, the plant, will be the size of the forest. So, armillaria solidipes, growing in Gifford Pincho National Forest, which is the forest 15 mi minutes away from my home, was considered the largest organism in the world. But then it turns out in the Ochico Mountains of Oregon, that national forest is bigger, and so their Armillaria ostea is bigger, or Solidipes is bigger, so that's now the world's largest organism. And how do we know that? If we take DNA here, 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 all throughout the forest, it's the same thing, it's the same animal. So we know that there's this one plant, and it's 800 years old, or you know, or, or what? And in different forests, it'll be different ages. If the forest, you know, has has been sitting there as that kind of a forest for 900 years, it's 900 years old. If it's a 200-year-old forest, the plant is 200 years old. It lives as long as the forest. The trees come and grow, go. The mushroom endures. It's there, hanging in there. Okay, so Armillaria ponderosa became Trichoma ponderosum, Trichoma magnifolari. Pine mushroom, American Matsutake, Matsi. I thought I found one of these yesterday, but it didn't have of cinnamon and dirty gym socks <laughs> that's so characteristic of uh, Matsutake. And the other, th the other way we know Matsutake, we squeeze, if you take it, put the stem in your hand, press it with your thumb. If it's not worm riddled, you can press with all your might and nothing's going to happen. It'll, it'll flex just a tiny bit. And that way you're not going to eat a deadly ammonita, or an ammonita that'll wipe out your kidneys, more specifically, which is what somebody did right near me last fall. Somebody gave them a bag of Matsutake, Matsis, and it was Armillaria ammonitis smithiana. They didn't know about the squeeze test, and they weren't, didn't have a very good nose, because the one thing smells like chlorine, this smells like red hots and dirty gym socks. So, Because this is such an important mushroom and commands such high value, you need to know how to key it out, how to identify it. And so this is a key that was written by Lorelei Norvell and Scott Redhead that'll help you identify Matsutake. So if it smells great, then we have to decide, you know, if it smells like nothing, forget it. But if it's the true Matsutake, we're talking $200 a pound. If it's the American Matsutake, $100 a pound, sometimes $100 a piece for a beautiful Matsutake. Now for pickers, when they're abundant, it'll drop down to $10 a pound. Even one, I, it's one year at my place they were selling for, the pickers were only getting $2 a pound for number one Matsis. They became so abundant. But lovely mushroom known by a lot of different names. But if you notice when I was talking about the Matsutake, we'll go back to that one just for a minute. Um, I used three different scientific names for the one species and three different common names, but there's only one accepted scientific name. There's no accepted common name. So. Uh, Trichoma magni valeri. And I kind of like magni valeri, thick ring. 
that's really what that means. And it does have that big, beautiful, thick ring. Um, so, Coprinus comatus is the type for the genus Coprinus. So, when this was the first thing ever described as a Coprinus, Coprinus comatus. And it's the shaggy mane, and it's so distinctive, it's one of what I call my 100 mile an hour mushrooms. I was cruising through Jasper National Park in the BC Alberta border one year, and they have about 100 yards cleared on each side of the highway before the forest starts. And for 20 miles, it was solid. Millions of shaggy manes. They have kind of an oyster-like flavor. I'm allergic to oysters, so I don't like it, but a lot of people really love this mushroom. So here we have Coprinus comatus. So whatever happens, we're safe. This is going to stay Coprinus comatus because it's the type. Type for the genus and the type for the species were great. And then we have this desert thing that you find. And if you carefully analyze the stipe of Coprinus comatus, down the center of the stipe, there's this little cord. Down the center of the stipe of this Montagnia arenaria that grows out in the sand dunes. It's sort of like a deformed Coprinus. It never uh, deliquesces. It just gets hard and brittle and breaks into pieces, and it spreads by pieces. But you have that same little cord. And when you look and this is something that Scott Redhead noticed, at agaricus, the store-bought mushroom, and its related species, it's got that same little cord down the center. And when you do the DNA, they're brothers and sisters. So agaricus, coprinus comatus, montagna arenaria, that share that one particular feature. So if you have the right feature, that's the unifying feature. But the deliquescing feature did not turn out. We'd put a whole bunch of things into um, Coprinus because they all deliquesce. This thing's got a hollow stipe, doesn't have that cord. And so, be because Copri Coprinus comatus <coughs> is the true Coprinus, it was the type, it stays Coprinus. Everything else that was called Coprinus that isn't related to comatus has to get a new name. Well, that's 99% of the species that were Coprinus comatus. Now, if this was the important one, we might have changed the type. But since the shaggy mane was the most interesting one to people, the one people wanted to eat, there was no argument. So everything else got booted out. And most of these things turned out to be closely related to Sathorellas, which are very fragile. And these are very fragile. But Sathorellas don't deliquesce. These deliquesce. So the, the unifying feature in this case is the fragility not the deliquescence, not the melting. The inky cat, by the way, I don't eat even without alcohol because the chemical that it contains that causes heart palpitations and tingling and stuff, uh, coprin, it's called. It's a three-membered ring, a really strange situation. They wanted to use it as a substitute for ad abuse to cure alcoholics. And, but in testing on beagles, they found that it uh, caused severe testicular damage. So a word to the wise about eating uh, Copronopsis atrumentaria. And then the things like be the beautiful Cop Copronopsis lagopus was Coprinus lagopus. But Coprinopsis. Coprinus micaceus becomes Coprinellus micaceus because it's genetically different. So the, the, this unified group of Coprinus turns out to be three different genera. So we've given it three different names. And this is another Coprinellus. Now this is a neat thing. This is all the mycelium. These are, usually the mycelium is white, boring, it all looks the same. But this particular one is just just spectacular. I'm sorry, I said three, it was four. <laughs> because these little things, which sort of dissolve away, <coughs> wound up in parasola. And they're beautiful little parasols. They're about the size of a penny to a dime, and you know, 
fantastic. This is the spectacular little pleated mushroom. But Coprinus comatus, we're safe. Mm -hmm. We're home free. Paxilus involutus. Here I've rubbed on the gills of Paxilus involutus. And when I rubbed on the gills, they peeled right away from the stem. Have any of you ever rubbed on the sponge of a boletus? It peels right away from the cap. If you rub on the gills of an agaricus, that don't happen. If you rub on the gills of almost any gilled mushroom, except leucopaxillus, that doesn't happen. But since leucopaxillus does this, paxillus does this, boletus does this, it may or may not be a surprise that they're all closely related, but they are. So this is a gilled bolete, paxillus involutus. It's sometimes listed as, as edible, but it has a very interesting toxicity. Uh, you can eat it for a year or two sometimes, but then your body builds up an immunity, an immune reaction to it, so that if you keep eating it, you can die. I mean, it's that violent a reaction to it. So Lepiota racodes, now chlorophyllum on the dites, chlorophyllum brunium, chlorophyllum oliveria. See, so it used to be really easy. Chlorophyllum had the green spores when it's mature. And you didn't eat the green spored one, because chlorophyllum molybdites is poisonous. But the white spored ones, those were lepiotas, and they were safe to eat. It turns out they're all chlorophyllums when you look at it. So, because they're all genetically related. And indeed, chlorophyllum molybdites, if we take a section of it and take a look at it under a microscope, those spores are white. They're, they don't turn green until the mushroom is popping the spores off. So you can get fooled. This causes more poisonings than any other single mushroom in the, Pacific, in the United States. This, this is not in the Pacific Northwest, but it is in Colorado, and it poisons a lot of people in Colorado. Because they think they have chlorophyllum um, racodes. Oh, oh man. Yeah. Uh, I have a major typo there. It's supposed to say chlorophyllum racodes. <laughs> And chlorophyllum racodes is a delicious edible. Boy, I've got to I got to get this thing pulled back and, and retype. <laughs> um, and it could be the size of a dinner plate, you know, and you slice this thing up, nice orange. And this also can be the slice size of a dinner plate. And I tell people to always eat mushrooms cooked, not raw. This thing can cause bloody vomiting and blood, bloody diarrhea raw. So I'm going to, and then morels. I'm going to try and move this around. Basically the story on morels is, this is where we're going to go to common names, because you can't look at a morel and tell what it is, because two morels that look alike turn out to be genetically different, two morels that look different turn out to be genetically identical. So we have white morels, white and yellow morels is one group, we have black morels as another group, and then we have the half-free morels as the third group. So these are all black morels. <clears throat> yeah, I know. And uh, Marcella tomentosa is one of the few we can put a name on. Semi-Libra turns out to be two different species. And then, but if, if the ridges run real vertically, it's a black morel. It's called the Western or Mountain Blonde. If the ridges are all twist it around, then it's your true yellow or white morel. So morels, there. This is where we're at. Thank you for coming. It's 10 o'clock. It's time to roll, but if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel, feel free. And I, I know you're all beginners in this audience here, and that's why you all came. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If it if it's an ammonita and you lay it in your hand and you squeeze it with your thumb, it's going to blow up on you. Even if there's no worms. Even if there's no worms. If it's a matsutake and it isn't wormy, you know, and it's a one you're going to want to eat, 
if you press on it, you hold it in your hand like that, and press with your thumb, you know, I can press till my, you know, until I'm literally just shaking. As much force as I can put on it, it'll hold. So you're not going to get poisoned. The smell is one test. Some people, to some people, the ammonitis smell like those mozzies. I can't understand how, but... Is that, is but, that true for all the ammonita? It's true for almost every gilled mushroom. If you put it in your hand and you squeeze like that, it's going to blow up. Now, there's, just, there's a few other hard ones, like catathalasma is hard like a matsutake. But it's one of my, and you'll make that mistake with a catathalasma, but it doesn't have the delightful odor, but it's not bad to eat. It wouldn't hurt you. Thank you. You said the, the matsis smell like money. Was that figuratively speaking? <laughs> no, no. The, 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 the smell is the red hots and dirty gym socks. Okay. But when you smell that, you say, oh, money, money. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, more generally, uh, what's being used to discriminate between species? Like what degree of genetic similarity? Is it identity or is there some no. cutoff? No, because you and I are not genetically identical. So the cutoff technically, and this is the thing that makes it difficult with mushrooms, is if the two will interbreed and produce mm -hmm. fertile offspring, they're the same species. If they won't, they're different species. Mm -hmm. But these mycorrhizal things, we can't do that with. So we really can't apply that test. So they just basically look at a whole bunch. Of, like I've just sent off a whole bunch of um, Boletus edulis collections from various parts of the world to find out how many different edulis there are in addition to the Boletus grand edulis that David Aurora has recently named. Because I think this thing in California is different than what we have in the mountains of Washington and is different than what we have on the coast of Washington. So, and, and I found a sucker who was really interested in edulis and so I sent him every dry thing I could get my hands on so they can take a look. But basically, there's computer programs that say these are similar enough, we're going to call them the same species. So is it all based on sequencing ribosomal RNA, or what, what are they used to sequence? They're, they're getting into, you, you can now do uh, like three loci for your five to eight dollars. And I have, um, all of this has evolved sort of since I retired, and I've stayed just sort of, I send things off and let somebody <laughs> sequence it, and I know. And the arguments are: is is this really? Are you sequencing the right genes? Yeah, yeah, that's and the so. That's right. always the question. And so, what we're pushing for, like Tom Brown's at, at uh, University of California at Berkeley, is he and I have just written a joint article about the need to do more of this. Uh, but we're just trying to decide how many loci, you know, and, and but basically more and more and more. The more you can do, the more certain you are of your conclusions. Yeah? Um, would you mind going back to the slide with the one that poisons more? Oh, the chlorophyllum. Yeah, how do you tell that from the edible version? Uh, <laughs> you don't. Okay. Um, because when this is in prime edible condition, yeah. the gills are white, the spore is white. So fundamentally, if I'm where this thing grows, I don't eat Lepiota racotes or, you know, I don't eat Grunium or all of, but see in the Northwest, we don't have Olivera, so you can eat those. Of course, I'm allergic to all three of those, so I can't eat them anyway, but that's a separate issue. Uh, but this thing here, really hard to get right. If you've got to get, get a spore, get one older one from the clump, and if it's old enough to get a spore print and the spore print is white, you're safe. As long as you don't, you don't have them both growing together, which is possible. But not usual. And the other thing is, if you're going to make a mistake, don't eat these things raw. I mean, chlorophyllum molybdides won't cause a huge amount of damage to you if you've cooked it. But if you eat it raw, it's really grim. Uh, Denver. Denver yeah. The Denver area has a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't expect it at this altitude. Is there a common name for 
Uh, green gill lepiota for chlorophylla molybdides. Yeah, green gill lepiota. But the gills are only green in older material. And I mean, I found this in LA before when I was just a beginner, and I didn't have enough nerve to eat it. And I'm sure what I was looking at was chlorophylla molybdides, but it was beautiful white and it didn't have a hint of the green. And then same in Hawaii, you know, there's a lot of chlorophyll molybdides in Hawaii.